Howdy doody folks, just getting myself set up here. Um, hmm. Need that. Uh, what else am I going to need? Interesting. What does it think I'm still flying? Rather strange. Uh, the status says it's not streaming, which is kind of odd. Really know what that's all about. Mm -hmm. <sighs> right. For some reason it's still saying offline hold on let me just check something here uh, how can i be offline Well, this is all very strange. Why does it think I'm offline? Let me just check. Bear with me, folks. Let's see if I can check now. Mm. Oh, come on. Uh, hi guys, this is kind of weird, it doesn't show me the right stats here, but when I look on my phone, it's definitely, definitely streaming, although I can't see who's online at the moment. I think it's just delayed. It's it's doing it now. Right. So uh, I need to get set up here. I've got half of this running. I need to cover news items first. Hope everyone's had a good week. First of all, apologies for not streaming on Wednesday. Um. It's kind of hectic this week and 
there's just no way my hands were just tied on Wednesday evening so I couldn't um, couldn't do my normal stream which is you know why I'm doing it Friday I mean it's not the first time I quite often have to move things to Friday I try to be as regular as I can with Wednesdays but sometimes things happen and it's unavoidable so that's why I'm streaming on Friday today um, hopefully everyone will have got the messages etc so what am I going to be talking about this morning let me get let's have a look uh, I've got a little um, list here Okay, so let's do the news first and the community stuff. Um, on the forum, on the MyStorm forum, uh, Al Mehia, Mehia, or Al Joe Mehia, depending whether you can use his Git name or uh, forum name, um, has mentioned that um, he's taken the Black Ice prog. Which I think is used by APIO and um, iStudio to do the programming of the Black Eye Sports. It's only a short Python uh, piece of code, but it, it basically serializes the bitstream uh, out to the serial port. Um, so it's called Black Ice Prog, but um, I think uh, Almeja was having problems on OS X. So um, he took a look at that, uh, and as a result, uh, hold on, can I get this? Let me just open this if I can. Uh, so he's forked Iceprog and created a version that I believe works with um, OS X. Something to do with the, uh, I think it fixes the port getting closed. For some reason it doesn't happen properly on the um, OS X operating system. Anyhow, the link's there. Um, and these forum posts uh, that to talk about it was here as well uh, in particular it's now supporting the black ice MX I believe as well apparently that wasn't working with it uh, I've yet to have a good view on that so I need to have a dig around and see what that's like um, Something else that he mentioned is that the nightly build of um, bear with me, Windows wants me to give it some attention. Hold on one sec. Right, so um, the nightly build of iStudio is apparently using Next PNR rather than Arachne PNR, which is kind of cool. Now I don't, I haven't looked at the iStudio stuff for some time, so I don't know what the current rev is. Maybe it's worth having a look at that whilst we're here. iStudio. Ooh, we've changed the uh, page. Um, if if no one's seen this, by the way, there's the link. iStudio is a like a graphical user interface for doing FPGA work uh, it's quite cool and it supports the open source tools as I say originally it was supporting the ice ice storm tools um, but apparently now it's also supporting things like next PNR as well which is cool so let's have a look at um, what it says uh, there's the repo by the way, in case you need it. 
Uh, and one um, APIO, by the way, is a tool that runs underneath this, which is uh, basically a, like a set of Python packages that enable you to install the uh, FPGA tools. So if you're not building them yourself, the open source tool set, or you're not using one of the uh, pre-built binary um, distribution tool sets, like the one I showed uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, APIO is quite good for installing that on Windows and um, works on Linux as well as uh, Mac OS X. It's even got some basic build commands built into it. As I mentioned before, the Black Ice Prog is part of that. It's got a number of different programmers, including the Ice Prog, which was the original one that used FTDI to program the ice chips. Anyhow, iStudio uses APIO, I believe, at a lower level to interface to the uh, hardware and to get the various tools, open source tool chain uh, set up that it needs. Um, so I'm just looking through this here. Uh, yeah, officially it only supports Black Ice 2, not Black Ice MX. Um, however, the way that we program the Black Ice MX is exactly the same. The thing that's different is the default PCF files or PIN configuration files for things like the sample, blink, etc., that you find in iStudio will use. The pinouts for the old Black Eyes 2, not the MX. So, if you're going to build a project in iStudio, you need to use the um, PCF or pinout files from Black Eyes MX. Make sure that it doesn't use the older ones. But in terms of programming, you could actually select to use Black Eyes 2 rather than MX because the way it programs is exactly the same. Um, let's see what it says on oh, releases. So that's the development version. 196 Windows Bug Master. View all branches. Hold on. Yeah. Development branch is the latest one. I don't think it's called Nightly. Maybe he builds it Nightly. Uh, Fix Mac OS 10 build in scripts. Let's just have a look at that. Darwin. Okay. Uh, I see there seems to be a lot more um, fr Python 3 as well. I hope he's moved everything over to Python 3 rather than 2.7. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah, let me have a quick look at commits. So if there's anything else in there whilst we're here. Uh, issues. No. Hold on. Commits. Oh, he does call it nightly. He does have a nightly nightly build. <clears throat> um, is there anything obvious here? So if we look at his latest nightly, yeah, there's no real notes here. It's just individual file changes. It's not going to tell me anything. <clears throat> Okay, so there's quite a bit going on, but nothing obvious on our side. Anyhow, so it's iStudio. Do take a look at it if you get a chance. Uh, if you come unstuck, getting it working with Black Eyes MX, let me know. I can help you out down on the forum. Okay, so that's that item. Oh, one of the other things. Um, who was asking at the forum recently? Someone was asking about Black Ice MX availability. Hold on. Hmm. 
Hmm. Ah, it was Electrified, who I know watches the um, stream. I don't think he watches it live. I think he watches the recording because he mentioned that the other day. Uh, he was asking, but a few other people were as well, which is um, I've been getting the um, some more of these made up. I say getting them made up. I mean making them up. Myself. So I've got a couple of stacks of those. I will um, add those full stock over the weekend along with some ice storms. So we should have a small uh, buffer stock at least of black ice and X. I know if you have been waiting for them. I've just got to program the uh, ice core boards and then put them together that put them in the, the appropriate packaging ready uh, cad cad i'm going to talk about the cad haven't really done much on the cad um i have been thinking about some changes um i did mention the tile stuff i believe last time maybe the stream before um so that that's going to change uh the new the new board let me just open this up and switch over to the cad setup if i can Mm. Give me a sec. Oh, yeah, here we go. Let me just. Hi Laurie. Yeah, I didn't know he was didn't know it was a nightly build. Um I'd lost touch a bit with Jesus. Um I'm using it on the ULX free, cool. I need to I did I think I messaged um Jesus about a couple of changes that I wanted to make. Um, and when we get to doing the alloy part of that, we're going to need some changes as well. I'm not quite sure. I haven't even thought about how I'm going to solve the uh, the ice studio part for alloy. Come back around to that in a minute, maybe. Um, because we're not using the serial port anymore. For all the black ice stuff, it's always um, been serial port. So it's all been universal nothing really had to change much as far as programming the board i mean obviously the pcf the pinouts etc changed and exactly what was on the board changed but it was always done through the serial port so the actual programming method that bit of python didn't really change on the apio that's underneath the alloy that's going to be different because we're not using the serial port to program it anymore we're just literally copying over the binary uh, onto the flash, which appears as a file system. So, I mean, it's not difficult. <laughs> it's like a line of Python. It just basically copies the binary. Um, onto the... Uh, 
onto the flat mounted flash drive however the naming is important at the moment it's just looking for a single name if you recall from the streams i mean we we will, we will circle back round to that because we'll be doing that later but i'm not sure what naming is used on iStudio for its output binaries i mean if if it's doing something consistent like always calling it chip dot bin then it's easy because we can just look for that file name we can look for a bunch of file names if we need to and when it sees that file it can uh, then start um, you know programming the FPGA with it anyhow I was going to do some CAD um, just review the CAD so this was the on the left here you should see so for the newer version of the alloy board you can tell it's a newer version because it has two extra pins compared to the rev a so the rev b that i'm working on at the moment has two extra pins so one of the things i was thinking of doing is a board that um, that takes the alloy rev b and will enable two tiles be fitted onto the board as well so we've kind of got a kind of tile board however the other day i was playing around with the ideas of even though this fits quite ni nicely in this kind of space we're not really using all the pins of the um feather here and what we might want to do possibly is have a feather slot as well as the um tiles that would mean that you could not only fit two tiles but you could also fit a feather you know that would normally fit on the feather wing so you'd have something like you know just do it roughly so rather than that being there it would be um Hold on. I seem to have missed it. Mm. So that could sit at the top here, across the top, and then on the other side, you could have a feather socket so you wouldn't need the p mod obviously um kind of be like that i guess hold on and then you have to dupe these You know, maybe something like that. Carvish tape is probably hmm. something like that, anyhow, and then that way um, the alloy sits in there, and then the feather peripheral sits in here, and then the two tiles fit in here. It does kind of leave a bit of space in the middle. I'm not quite sure what we're going to do with that. Anyhow, one to think about. Um, let me just go back.
Okay, so that's that stuff. Um, no other real changes on the CAD side. Um, I haven't sent off the order for boards yet because I want to get that tile board done first so I can build both at once, which I should get off next week. Um, so I've been doing some more work on the software. And what joy. What joy that has been. Um, but oh, before we do that, uh, if you remember when I ordered the um, the Rev A boards, I also ordered these. So this is like a, a feathered water board, effectively. Now we do have to focus here. My thumb is on the way, probably. Mm. Okay, but anyhow, on here you've got the alloy you can go in the center, and then um, you can put two feathers or you can put a mixed mod on the top. So uh, I've set one of these up for testing purposes, which is slightly different. So let me show you what that looks like. Um, I've got some stuff connected to it at the moment, so you need to be a little bit careful. But uh, in fact, what I'll do is get the um, overhead working easier. Bing bong, bear with me a sec. So. Ooh, looks like this has moved. You're good. Mm. Here we go. Let me see if I can get it sorted. Yeah, sorry folks, it seems to have moved a little. Let me try and get a good angle on it. Um, so this is the um, uh, Rev A. Still not as sharp as it could be. Bear with me. Thank you. 
Hmm, that's annoying. Fun and games today, folks. That was bloody difficult. I really need to get a better lens for this. So, um, so that's sitting on one of these daughter boards, Ta -da! which is kind of this way around, reversed, and here at the bottom you could fit another feather in oh sorry a feather in and then at the top i've got male headers um, these are great for test points so i can test in situ um, all of these pins the standard pins for the feather which appear on the device below or effectively repeated up here so i can hook onto them so i've just populated these with males rather than the normal feather females here uh, and then on the right hand side, what I've got is effectively um, the mix mod. And then plugged into the mix mod, uh, what I have is the what's called a mix mod. It used to be called a mix mod tester, but it's actually a mix mod extender now. So the mix mod standard. Uh, adds analog and 5 volt and ground to the P mods. Um, so it can either take single, double, or quad P mods. Now, what the tester or extender does is it actually breaks out all of the pins and it's a kind of man in the middle board. So you can put uh, a mix mod. Uh, with the extender in between it and the uh, PMOD board. So what will happen is you can then intercept all the signals on these headers here, which is what I'm doing, um, because we'll need to look at that a bit later. Um, so this way I get to test everything that's going on rather than just, you know, as I start interfacing with things, it's uh, rather than just using the board alone, having it placed in this harness actually enables me to do a bit more. So um, I'm kind of eating my own dog food in that respect. And the, the stuff that I've been working on this week is primarily focused on interfacing between the ESPS2 and the FPGA. So we've already got the ESP32 reprogramming the FPGA and we've got that working. Um, and we also, I think, last time we looked at that, um, we were probably generating a clock just to do some simple LED stuff. 
So at that point, the code that we were running, which was all written in Python, that was running on ESPS2, was capable of picking up, you know, the logic.bin or chip.bin file that's been deposited onto the mounted drive and reprogram the FPGA, the ICE 45K in this case. Having done so, it then produces a, a clock signal, which gets output, which can then be used um, in the FPGA to run your uh, HDL or whatever that may be. So um, the next bit really is building that um, that interface between the two such that there's a standard component or components um, that will enable us to um, communicate between CircuitPython or if you're running C um, C and what's going on in the HDL, i.e. what's burnt into the ice, the ice 40. So that's what I want to spend some time doing today. And I, and again, in the tradition of eating my own dog food, I am developing this using the tools that I'm going to be pushing forward for the alloy fusion i.e. Python talks rather than just uh, what we did before with Verilog serial ports and everything else. So let me switch over. Let's have a look at some of the code. Um, yes, hold on. Uh, Let me just move, get rid of this CAD. Hold on. It's going to get in the way otherwise. And let me also just reduce the size of this window because it's massive, man, massive. And it's going to be knocking me on the side of my head it's that close so let's take a look um, like this uh, this is going to be fun fitting all these windows in oh boy is this going to be fun I'm going to have to add another window in a minute um, so let's look first at the code. Hold on. Do 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 do. Right. How are we doing for code size? Do I need to up the font size, Laurie or anyone? I'll just take it up a little bit because it was rather small. One. Bear with me. Uh, color scheme. Uh, console font. Let's take that up to like, was it 24? I think we had last time. And oh, yeah, we need to increase the editor. that readable guys let me know if it's too small hope my audio levels right I didn't do any audio checks today levels look okay from this side maybe a bit peaky um, so what I want to talk about just to remind you guys where we are code wise here so what we're going to need to do so there's a bunch of different parts uh, to what we need to do here. 
just to remind you what's running where. So we have circuit Python that runs on the ESP S2 microcontroller. Now the code for that sits in Flash. The Flash is partitioned. Part of that is available mounted as a drive on our system. So in order to code within Python, all we need to do is open code.py that's on that mounted drive and edit the file. It's that simple. As soon as we save the file, it reloads it. Um, Adafruit went in that direction because it just makes things simple. And I kind of understand it. There are some gotchas with it that I've been discovering recently, but it, it's nice and simple. So the Python part of what has to go on here is that when that Python, let's call it a script, when that Python script called code.py is run, i.e. whenever it's seen to change, um, there needs to be an initial bit of code that will have a look, find the binary file for the FPGA, serialize that, reprogram the FPGA, and then the code after it's done that will then need to talk to the FPGA in whatever way it needs uh, to do. So there is some code that we've already written, which is the programming the FPGA bit which we have it run first then we have it um, actually run some unique code that communicates with the ice 40 or more particularly communicates with the image that's been programmed into the ice 40 I, the, <coughs> the realization of the uh, rtl or hdl that's been implemented into the ice 40. So there's two parts to the circuit Python bit. One is when it starts up, load the appropriate uh, FPGA image into the FPGA, resetting it. And then the second part is interact as is required by whatever the app is that you're writing, etc., with the uh, FPGA that's been programmed. Now, so there's two parts of the Python, uh, circuit Python. One is initialization, the other is really just the uh, app-based interaction. Now, in order for the app to interact with whatever is in the ICE 40, it uses a bus in between the two. Now, initially we're using SPI, but that's going to be Quad SPI as well. Pins are there for Quad SPI. Um, the initial implementation is just SPI. So one of the things I've been working on is that SPI stuff. And I've been trying to eat my own dog food by writing it in Python. So the second part here that isn't circuit Python, it's Python that effectively gets run on the computer, your laptop or desktop PC, etc. Now that uses something called nmigen. The nmigen part, again, is broken into different pieces. So you've got all the nmigen libraries, obviously. Um, there has to be a board file. Sorry, not a board file. There has to be a board code driver, effectively, that programs and does simulation and things like that with the correct tools. Now, we covered some of that very briefly doing, I think it was probably Blinky or Trail on the last last stream, and that was written in nmigen. But in order to do that, we also had the um, the board control file for Alloy. So let's have a look at that here. So that's what we're opening. A um, couple of things I've added since we saw last time at the top here. I just defined um, some p mods now. This is an interim version of this file because normally this wouldn't go in the 
or it wouldn't be like this for the alloy foil because the only p mod on the alloy is a is a double one uh on the rear um but because we got it plugged into this expansion board i needed to get access to the mix mod ports i.e the expansion ports on that daughter board so i've just temporarily put these into uh, the alloy board file so i've described basically at the top here is what the pins are for those p mods if you were to plug them into the mix mod now in the side um, so these are the pin numbers and these are obviously the descriptive names on the ice 40 itself um, the way these are expressed is kind of a bit bonkers so the blank the underscores or minuses here are really just unused pins think of them as spaces really because these will get used down here so I've actually added some connectors so before we had an empty connector set so I've actually added mix mod pinouts and p mods so if we want to use those in an nmigen piece of code we can do that because I've got them all defined in this board file and we can just pull them up um, the other thing I had last time was the flash bit which I've disabled for the moment uh, I did start adding this, this SPI resource, which I was going to use to do the communication, but I hit some, I hit some issues this week doing, getting all this stuff to work. And one of the things I was worried about was this SPI resource abstraction was maybe something I didn't quite understand how that was written and defined. I was looking at it a bit more deeply today, and I think. I can probably use it okay but just because I was having problems with other things I decided it would probably be a good idea just to use the bare pins to start with just to rule out issues with that abstraction so what we have here is some resources um, individually defined in this case just like we defined the LEDs before so here I'm defining four pins which are basically the SPI pins. They should be self-explanatory. Clock pin, master out, serial in, master in, serial out, and uh, a chip select. Okay. So I've made a couple of minor changes really just, just to the board file so that we've got the resources there that we, we need to then write our NMIGEN script not script, our uh, nmigen abstraction model in our nmigen domain specific language or whatever we call it, DSL. So the other thing I did, um, let me just take you back and show you the simple one before I show you a more complicated one. So I think we had That was what we did for Blinky. Just to remind you of what the structure of this, this simple NMIGIN um, HDL uh, description was. So obviously we have to import all of the NMIGIN bits and pieces that we need. Then we have... Um, hmm. I don't want that. Then we create a class, in this case Blinky. Uh, that extends elaborable uh, or elaboratable, which enables the uh, NMIGEN base support. And then we have a simple thing. So first of all, we're pulling out effectively a, a pin that's connected to an LED. And what we're doing is platform requests. So that, that goes and queries that file we've created and it finds the yellow LED. So if I just switch back, you'll see. What we're doing is we're selecting this resource here yeah, from the platform. They call it platform. 
because we want to know what that pin is. So there's no pin numberings in this nmygen file. It's been abstracted away. Um, I'm then creating a timer or counter, if you like, a 24-bit counter. That's the way it's done in nmygen. I will always then create a module, uh, just like you would have a module in something like Verilog, which is a chunk. This is your top level module in this particular case. Uh, I'm then creating some simple synchronous and combinational logic. So the combinational logic really just ties uh, the LED, makes it equal to, yeah, the LED output equal to uh, the last bit of the timer. The most significant bit that's what the minus one there's some real weirdness that i've been discovering trying to get used to nmigen when you've come from something like verilog um python always uses array indexes and or list indexes effectively but it also uses slices now slices are used within nmigen so slices are a way of dicing up your list so by having minus one here, what we're saying is we just want the last one effectively. Uh, but you'll see some more of this stuff going on when I go into the other stuff where you can actually select a number of bits. So for example, if I wanted the first two bits, I wouldn't have minus one there. I'd have, you know, uh, zero to one. Wouldn't make sense in this case because my LED is only one bit, right? Okay. Oh, and then um, so after and sorry, the synchronous part of the logic or AC, these the um, t time combination part. Uh, this is equivalent, you know, if, by adding it to MD sync, it's the equivalent in Verilog of doing an always at pause edge. Notice there's no definition of clocks in here. It makes assumptions about clocks because in our description file, we described the clock and we gave it a name. We decide our default clock for all domains. So in other words, if we're not specifying a specific clock domain, it will use the default domain. So we don't need to add that in. It automatically assumes that from our definition of the clock and it's clocked in here. Um, so all of the MD sync things will happen on that clock positive edge automatically. So in this case, all I'm doing is I'm incrementing the timer. So I'm making the timer equal to what the timer was clock cycle before plus one. Very simple. So this just counts up. So when it gets to bit 24, when that flips over, it flips the state of the LED and gives us something that flashes, you know, at like one second. Because obviously the clock's running at like 24, 25 megahertz. So it has to be divided down by 2 to the 24 or 2 to the 23 in order to give us a decent signal. So that's that part. And then this part at the bottom is what runs. That's just like the main in Python. Um, so first of all, we grab our platform which is based on the alloy remember I called it alloy oh I just closed it so that was dark let me open it again um, so if you look here it's called the alloy platform which in itself um, derives from the lattice size 40 platform so it derives all the lattice stuff so we're we are effectively bringing into existence uh, an alloy platform, one of our boards, if you like. And then um, we're, we're actually doing a build here. So this is very simple. So we're taking Blinky here. We're passing in a parameter called port. And in this case, the destination of where the file goes. So I'm, I'm sending it to D drive D and I'm calling it logic.bin uh, but this could be a serial port. if it wasn't alloy it could be um, like black ice MX or two 
Uh, that's where the port name come from because I, I did that for the MMIGEN support for Black Ops 2 and, and MX. Thanks, Laurie. You're probably going to pick me up on a whole bunch of these things. I'm still getting my head around in my gym. Um, yes, because it's not inclusive. So what Laurie's saying here is, you know, on the selector here, if I had uh, zero colon one, that's only one bit because it's not inclusive. Well, it includes zero, but it doesn't include one. So it includes the LSB only. Uh, if I wanted two bits, I'd actually have to do that. And then it will give me bit zero uh, and bit one, at least two significant bits. Thank you for that correction, Nori. Do keep an eye on my Python. I may be probing you for uh, solutions later because I've got some issues with a bit of my code. But anyhow, uh, and then I'm doing do program true. So this is an underlying support thing for the platform build. Uh, so in other words, after building uh, this, actually program the board, that's all that's saying. So that was your simple blinky. But now what we're gonna do is something a bit more sophisticated, because what we're gonna do is we're gonna do uh, some interfacing between the two. So we need to, do a kind of spy like thing and this has been a lot of fun this week i've forgotten quite how tricky this can be building things from scratch um particularly in a new environment that i don't have a lot of experience with i.e n migen and m migen let's just say it's not very well documented uh, at the moment um it could do with some more support effort uh, and there isn't actually that many good examples out there either when you start looking. But that will change because we're going to be building some. Uh, Laurie says, I hit these problems when I was trying and my gym recently. Yeah, some of it's not intuitive. I also have problems with cat. I don't know if you've used the cat, uh, which is like... Um, uh, concatenating that you do in Verilog with the curly brackets. Uh, well, in, in M, Mygen, you use cat open brackets and then you list them. And that. But it's kind of arse about face. Very confusing. It's tripped me up a couple of times already. It doesn't, it's just in my head, it's not logical. Uh, I don't know if you've had that one, Laurie. That one's caught you out. But yeah, the combination of using slices for your index referencing uh, is different from what you'd see in something like Verilog. And also the, uh, when you start doing your um, concatenating, that is slightly unintuitive in my opinion as well. Um, as is the uh, replication. Uh, but some of these things are just more Pythonic than they are uh, HTL, if you like. So they just take some getting used to. But it is a case of kind of pulling the Verilog head off and putting uh, the Python head on in some cases. So um, let's move over now to what I've been working on. Um, what's I saying? My multiple LEDs example. Let's have a look. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me just create a new scratch file in Python. And I can show you, this is what I'm looking at, what... Um, Uh, what Laurie has sent me, so he's using the ULX3 board here. So we've got an LED class, LED platform request LED. So he's getting the pin out um, for I in range 8 
So there's eight LEDs, presumably. Okay, interesting. So he's getting each LED. Um, so he's using Python's list comprehension here. So on the left-hand side, is it, it will create a list of these items it, that are created from this loop of eight. Um, because you can name something in your, I haven't done it in mine here, but if I go back to the um, LEDs, ooh, wrong one, here, I've given them all zero, but I could have just used LED and had a different indice here, which is what is probably happening with the ULX3. Uh, let's have a look. Is the ULX free not there? Maybe my copy's older. I thought it was in there. Okay, whatever. Um. So he's pulling up eight LEDs as a set, effectively. Uh, he's doing a timer, 26-bit in this case. He's doing the new module. He, for his synchronous uh, parts, he's always bits, if you like, clock, pause-edge clocked. Uh, he's just adding one to the timer. And then for his combinational part, he's using a cat here. This is going to be interesting. See if I can get this. God, so he's cutting... I dot O for I in LED. So he's getting the list of LEDs numerically in order and he's replacing I with that number. So he's got a bunch of, you know, one dot out, two dot out, etc. etc. Um he's then making those equal Ooh from bit nine no from bit the last eight bits the most significant eight bits of the timer did i get that right laurie <laughs> it's confusing when you look at it, it does take some getting used to not quite as clear i think as parallel but i mean i'm a bit biased but there you go uh the other bits are pretty much the same Cool. So now we're going to step up to something even more ridiculous. Oh boy, did I have some fun with this this week. So um, I was looking to see if I could find a decent SPI example and I couldn't. That was the simplest way I could find to count on eight LEDs. Uh, yeah, I might have done it slightly differently, but it probably wouldn't have taken any less lines. Um, okay, so I've had a great deal of fun trying to get some SPI action happening on Alloy. <sighs> the first mistake I made was trying to do it too quickly because i wanted to try and get it done for wednesday before everything went a bit uh peat tong uh and of course that failed miserably uh, i tried to do two things i tried to do an m migen one had some problems with it then tried to do a fer ferrolog one and then worked backwards into m migen to do it and that just failed. I, I just couldn't get it done with everything else going on on Wednesday. So I kind of put it to one side. And then yesterday and today I've been working a bit more on it. And I got quite a lot done yesterday and today. Although I didn't get it all finished. Uh, I've got a frustrating... 
problem um, with the actual SPI from the ESP32 that I, I just can't fathom at the moment. But anyhow, so I decided on uh, Thursday morning that I was going to look at it a bit more carefully um, and do things like solder up the board, etc., and just get stuff uh, in order a bit better. Um, let me see if I can add. Ooh, where are we now? Let's see if I can add board in here. Bear with me. There's going to be so many things I'm going to need actually. Right, before we do that, let's have a quick look at the implementation. So, there's a lot in here and there's a lot of comments and scrappy stuff as well. But what we're effectively writing is a kind of SBI slave. And we're doing it in N Um This thing at the top I'll come back to in a bit. It's a test point. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking actually one of the PMODs. Because if you remember, um, I've broken out. Yeah, so it's probably a good idea here to show you the board if I can. So let's just switch back briefly. So if I just move this over slightly. So I've got the mix mod here. And then the mix mod extender or tester, which is breaking out uh, the pins of the mix mod on this header. So these outputs are directly connected to the FPGA. I need them there because I need to be able to output some signals for diagnostic purposes. <laughs> or so I thought. Now, what I wanted to do, because I was having problems with the HDL that I'd written in MMIGEN, um, I figured I should really do it a bit more sensibly and deal with um, a couple of levels before actually having the ESP talk to it. Bear with me here. My thinking is, there's a couple of things you want to do. One is you need simulation. Okay. And mygen has got some great simulation support. Uh, you could add formal as well. I'm not going to cover that here. Don't worry. Don't have to run away. Um, so there's a simulation part. And what that does is it produces, it will simulate my design and I will be able to go and analyze it. So we're going to have a look at that in a minute. Um, and then the other part is a bit like a test bench, whereby rather than having the ESP32 creating signals for the SPI code, um, I actually create the SPI signals inside the FPGA itself, and I hook up my SPI as a sub-module to that, which I can then send information to. So my thinking here is get the simulation doing what I think is right, because it gives me some visual um, clues, and then get it running on the FPGA itself before I start talking uh, from the ESP32. All sounds sensible, right? Um, but it takes quite a bit of work. But Believe you me, the problems I found doing this uh, make it well worthwhile. You know, how people say they can do right stuff without debugging, without simulation, without test benching, etc. 
for anything other than really simple um you've either got a lot of experience or you just got you know big cajulies and you're going to trip over them because it's all too easy even with something as simple as a protocol like spm it's very easy to mess up because you're juggling a lot of things in your head it's not like regular programming where you've got good abstractions that you can hook onto you know in your head symbolically with logic you've got lots of small signals and states and holding all of those in your head is kind of tricky along with the timing information so let's take a look at that so um first of all let's rather than diving into the actual meat and veg uh remember this is our main for our nmigen hdl here we're doing something slightly different what we're doing is we're looking at the arguments that we were passed in because normally what you do to run this is you just do this python free it's got to be python free actually for nmigen um and then the name of the file which in this case is alloy underscore spi.py right and that will make sure that this runs but what we're going to do is look at any arguments that are passed in because we we're going to do different things depending on what we're doing here so first thing i'm going to do is have i passed in the simulate argument because if i passed in the simulate argument i don't need to program the board what i need to do is something different i need to run the internal simulator in my in my gen, and i need to output effectively a vcd file okay so let's have a look at that so what we're saying here is uh, first of all we're printing the arguments we're creating a new instance of my not device under test device under simulation but our uh, hdl under simulation um, just to let you know it's called the fpga that's the class yeah just like we had blinky in the last one this called this is called the fpga in this case not necessarily a good name but i wasn't going to spend too much time thinking about that so i'm creating an instance of that fpga uh, i'm getting the simulator and i'm adding a clock to it in this case And a period to run it for okay you then you can run a what's called a process now the process you can define here is steps so you could single step all your way through and have it doing very individual things in this case I'm just gonna run it for a period of time which is equivalent to whatever the sync period is that's the resolution of what time the number of clocks that I want to run it for okay and those will be arguments i pass in um i then add the actual process that's going to be running or governing that simulation and then i basically run the simulation and at the same time i output the vcd now a vcd file if you're not familiar with it is basically like a change file for all of the signals so all of the signals that you're simulating every time they change there's a new entry with the new value of each of those uh, different signals the inputs and outputs if you like and the internals so that you can analyze them um, so the name of that file is passed in from the command line i create a um, gtk wave file as well uh, we can't actually use that unfortunately because I'm running on Windows subsystem for Linux just to complicate things um, when you open it with a Windows application that GTK wave file because I've actually installed GTK wave um, as a native Windows application because the original Windows subsystem for Linux doesn't have a graphical user interface it's command line only um, the paths because 
This will be created under Windows Subsystem for Linux, not under Windows. The paths under Windows Subsystem for Linux are different to the native uh, Windows paths. Um, so the GTK file is all messed up, so it doesn't understand it. So we can ignore that. But basically, the VCD file is good. Uh, the other thing I give is the traces here. Yeah. So what I'm saying is there's a bunch of ports that I want you to follow through the simulation. So my FPGA object has a function, a, de a def defined method, if you like, um, which enumerates the ports, which is here. So what I output here is a whole bunch of stuff. Um, uh, the SPI signals, um, the internal representations of those signals that have been captured and synchronized with the clock, the data shift register, which is being used to bung the data in as we're deserializing it, and the output data as well. Okay. And then we run the simulation. So let's run the simulation first. So what I would do is I would go, let's have a look here. this for example so this is a command that i would run so i'm running python 3 and i'm running my alloy to spi but this time i'm passing in a whole bunch of command line parameters to tell it what to do so in this case what i'm saying is simulate rather than just do a build and program then i'm passing in the vcd file name so i want it to be called spi vcd uh, also the gtk wave name even though we're not going to use this how what the speed of the clock is uh, 4 times 10 to the minus 8 and the number of clock cycles mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, OBS just reported to me that it disconnected and then reconnected. Um, let me just check what we're still online. Let's see if I can see where we are, stream manager. Funny how that's more up to date than my status things here. Uh, hopefully you guys can still see me. I can see that you, I can see you guys or some of you. Let me know in the chat. I will continue. So where were we? So um, so here is the command line uh, that I use for running that. So having run that, that creates the uh, VCD file, and then we can. Um, take a look at that so let's let's look at what we're doing with that this is going to be joyous let me add this in Just 
resizing this window, bear with me folks. Oh, I'm going to be hiding underneath it slightly. Hold on. I'm not sure how well this is going to be visible. How does that look, guys? I know it's difficult to fit all this stuff on the screen. So what we're looking at here is a simulation. Let me just scroll right out. Hold on. So in this simulation here, um, I can show you the code at the same time, hopefully. Hold on. Just rearranging fix. That's a little bit better because I've got the code on the top as well. Oh, right. So on the simulation, what we're doing here is we're effectively simulating the signals. And let me bring up the code to do that. So what we do if we're running the sim function here instead of the normal elaboratable which we do on a normal build we have a specific method here which is um, a simulation function now what this does is it creates a bunch of resources like top level set of resources in HDL um, that is going to generate the SPI um, activity and then it's going to um, run that on the uh, FPGA HDL that interprets the SPI. So let's have a quick look at that code first um, and then we can move back The cat knocking things over again. Honestly, the I wonder if I can move this down a little bit first. Just going to crush it up a bit more, guys. Bear with me, just buying myself a bit more room. Should just about see the whole code here that's readable. Let me know if it's not. So in the code itself, first of all, with uh, I'm, I'm forming a counter, just like we form the time the timers. In this case, it's a 10 bit wide uh, register effectively. And we're going to increment that. Um, I'm creating a signal which is the source data or the SPI or the serial data. So I'm calling it S data. Um, notice that this is 8 bit wide. The SPI that we want to simulate here is an 8-bit transaction. Notice when we're creating this signal we've got this thing in here which is reset equals da -da -da. 
So basically what we're doing is we're stipulating at reset what the value of this signal is going to be. Uh, I don't actually need that now, but that was useful when I was debugging to have that pattern there. Um, my next signal here is what's called clock H is basically short for clock history because I need to uh, remember what the last state of the clock was because when I come to deal with the edges uh, I will need that information. So just like when we were in the elaborable uh, part of our FPGA description, the first thing we do is we create a module to house everything. Um, and then we're going to actually create a sub module, which is in this case itself, because this is a method of FPGA. Self in this case is the FPGA HTL class. So we're going to name that as a sub module of this module called FPGA. And then we're going to stimulate the FPGA module. Okay. So here's some uh, Enmigen weirdness. Um, because what you're building in Enmigen is effectively a um, a model of your HDL. It's not using the native if else structures that are in Python because we're not running it in Python. When we run this Python, it creates the HDL abstraction. It doesn't run it in the simulation it, it passes the information to it of course so in this case here this is a way of doing an if with an else if okay which is pythonic in its uh, nature elif but this is a way of encoding that model so it's saying in this case when bit six of the counter or the inverted bit six of the counter is true in other words when bit six is false um then we then we want what we want to do is have some synchronous logic that basically Serial data will equal uh, 7 to 10. So this is the data I'm going to send. Rather than just sending a constant uh, numerical value, like I created a reset at the top here, that's a constant value. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm reading the upper bits of this counter. So this value will actually change and it will count from zero all the way up to um, seven. Now what am I talking about? Yes, yeah, seven. So um, because for each byte that I send, I want that value to be different. For debugging purposes um, it's easy to get tripped up if you keep sending just the same value uh, and I know this because I did start off sending the same value that one at the top that I reset it at I thought it was working but it wasn't subsequently it just happened to be a bit pattern that worked for a particular bug so um, I've got a variable value that changes over a cycle um, if that bit is false, bit six, because um, bit six is really um, effectively eight bits counted on the counter from bit two. So basically our clock, we're using bit two of the counter. So that's a quarter or whatever of the uh, master clock. So what I'm saying here is when the clock goes from 1 to 0, remember I had the clock H historical, um, 
I know that I've got a negative edge in this case. So I can then set my S data. Basically to be shifted. This is a shift operation. So inside here you've got a cat, which is a concatenate if you like. And what it does is that it takes all of the S data bits apart from the MSB which it replaces with zero. Okay. And then it passes that into S data. So it refreshes the value. It's shifting the value of S data and shifting in a zero. Um, so that is what's running there at the top level. Um, then down here, what we have is, uh, the counter logic first of all. So this is a synchronous section rather than a combinatorial section. And that's incrementing the counter. We're also recording what the last value of our serial SCK clock, SPI clock was, because we need that historical value here. And what we're also doing is serializing the output to the master out or serial into the FPGA code so we're taking the msb effectively of that and reading that and serializing it uh, combinationally what we're doing here is where you we're, we're setting the clock value to that of the output of the bit bit two of the counter as i mentioned before and the cs i.e. chip select, basically that divided by 8, i.e. bit 6 of the counter. So I've now got my automated, so that will literally generate an SPI-like signal. And it will pipe it into the FPGA uh, HDL via Mozzie, SCK and CS. So it generates those signals. So if we look back here, just to refresh some of this. So if I look at, for example, the, um, so let's look at a transaction here. So that's the main clock running across the top. This is the uh, chip select going down. So that's actually starting to do a transfer in this case. Uh, we see uh, Mozzie throughout that period at zero because the first digit it's sending is zero. So if we look at the data here, see the value down here? It's actually zero. That's what we're sending, S data. So when you serialize that, there's nothing in it. Let's move on to a more interesting one. So the next one we look at, so this is the next transfer, the next byte. What we're transferring here is the S data value of 0, 1. So here when we look at the, uh, the CS signal, look at the Mozzie signal, and we can see that one bit, the least significant bit, being high on the last clock cycle. This is the SPI clock cycle, the SCK is being output. Okay. And if we scroll further on the next cycle, we can see the value of two. So this isn't on the LS, the, the um, sorry, that was the MSB. This is the penultimate MSB i.e. a value of 2 and then next we have a 2 and a 1 and then we have a 1 0 0 and then a 1 0 1 and then a 1 1 
zero. And well, then we run out of clock cycles. But the last one will be returned back round. So that's the top half of this. So that's being generated by this simulation of n nigen stuff. Down below that is what we've got going on inside the device, which is the actual FPGA code itself. So this has a bunch of internal signals here, some of which we can see, some of which we can't. So uh, one of the things that we have to do, so uh, bits here is the number of bits it's receiving. So it can count the bits. That goes up to eight, obviously, creating the module. The first thing we do is we synchronize all those input signals from the outside world. I know it's not coming from the outside in this simulation. It's being generated internally. But normally those signals will not be synchronized, i.e. they're just happening at whatever clock rate. So what we've got happening there is that these uh, signals have to be synchronized. So the way that we do that is if we look at these signals, SS, SCK, and SI internally here, these are registers of two bits width. Uh, the reason that we're doing that is we're effectively creating, we're shifting into these two bits. So we've got current state and the previous state and we just shift them through these registers that synchronizes the incoming but also gives us a record so we can see on things like the clock if there's a zero one we can see it's a transition positive or a one zero it's a negative edge transition because we're going to need that in our logic so we're shifting in the cs signal into this two-bit register here uh, so again, this is a serialization, Enmigen serialization. We're resetting, we're, we're, we're setting the value of SS to what it was before minus its MSB, and we're replacing the MSB, sorry, the LSB with, in this case, with the um, with the incoming signal, and likewise with the clock signal that's coming in and with the data signal that's coming in we're doing exactly the same thing so if we go and look now at the gtk you can see those signals here you can see these values so the sck signal if we look at that carefully here see how it changes as the clock above it changes As it shifted through, I scroll in a bit closer to that. So more importantly here, if we have a look at that SCK, see it goes zero one 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 zero. Basically, this corresponds to the edge, the positive edge here, because it's one one clock cycle behind, by the way, because um, this is how we're sampling sampling it. So here it's a positive edge, zero to one. Then it's one 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 for several clock cycles. Then there's a negative edge, and that appears as one zero in our shift shifted value. So we can use that later. Likewise, if we look at the serial in value, that's not actually changing much here. Not until we actually get a serial signal. Um, whoa! I didn't mean to do that. Sorry, folks. Let's just go into this signal here. Yeah, so if we look at the value of mozzie here, we see it's changing. The serial in is changing here. So we detect a transition, then the value, and then the negative transition there. And the same for the chip select. We see a transition, in this case, towards the end here. back to the editor and the code. So what we're saying here in this piece of synchronous 
uh, HDL is basically when the chip select is low. Uh, in this case, I'm looking at the shifted bit one that's been captured in and synchronized. When that's low, in other words, when the transfer is happening, we're not interested when the transfer is not happening. Then I'm saying when the uh, clock, the serial clock, is a positive edge. I've already defined PE up here as a transition from binary zero to one, just as you saw in the timing charts here. That's why we need those signals, so we can detect that. So if the chip select is low, and if we see a transition of the clock, positive edge transition of the clock, we need to look at capturing the information from MOZU. Um, so each time this happens, I'm going to increment the, num the bit counter to indicate that we've read another bit or are reading another bit. And then what I'm going to do is shift that data into the shift register for the data here. Again, using that same technique that we saw earlier, we're doing a concatenation of all of the current shift register data bits, apart from its most significant bit, uh, which we're adding from the value of the serial in, synchronized serial in. So that's getting shifted each time. Uh, the second bit here looks for the positive edge of the chip selector uh, SS pin or the shifted synchronized shift select because uh, when it sees that it sees that as a sign uh, that it needs to set the ready signal to say that data has completed its transaction we have the eight bits we need um, so it copies what's in the shift data register into the data register. So these two signals can signal to the outside world or any other HDL that's connecting to this module. All it needs to do is look at the ready signal to know that data is available to it. And then it can actually go and get the data from this register. Um, the other thing that we do on the uh, on the negative edge, i.e. as we go down at the beginning of the transaction, is we actually reset the um, the number of bits to zero, obviously, because we're starting again, and we also turn off the ready signal, because we're about to receive another one. We're no longer ready to start transmitting that data. That data transfers. Okay, we're into the next byte, effectively. So it's a very simple piece of code. And if you look down here, you can actually see it operational. So uh, let's have a look at the, if we look at the shifted in data here, might be difficult to see here. Hold on. I'll move this. Hmm. So if we look at this shift data register, we can see the data being shifted in. So it starts off with zero, obviously. As soon as these bits are received, it starts shifting these bits in from the MOSI signal. And then eventually the data gets transferred. In this case, it's just one. Uh, then we see that shift register being emptied on the transition positive edge of the CS pin. And we see that going into the data register here. So a lot of the problems I had early on, I could see straight away in here, um, which I couldn't see. You know, you don't have any way of seeing what's going on with your logic. It's easy to make a mistake with the logic that's happening down at this low level it requires a great deal of attention to detail and what the simulation does is it enables you 
to check what your understanding of what it's doing internally actually happens in order of the various different register values and signal values inside the HGL. So it's like being able to go and zoom in at any moment in time on that. And it's an essential part, particularly if you're learning a new HDL that you're not familiar with. Um, so when I do this, what happens? Does it really do what I think it does? Well, in here, you can actually see what's going on. What it won't tell you is the weirdness about the I.O. sections of the FPGA where it interfaces to the real world. It's, it can't, can't tell you about those, but it can tell you what it looks like, what's going on inside um, the actual HDL itself inside the chip effectively in terms of the simulation. And it's so easy with all these signals to miss something out, get it wrong, get your timing off, by enough for it to not work. Um, so that first stage enabled me to get to a point where it looked like it, not only was I simulating the right kind of SPI signal, I was creating the right kind of signal, uh, but also that, you know, working it through the logic inside the uh, FPGA SPI deserialization, I could see that it was doing... Um, what I was hoping it would do. Not only that, you also get to see the clock shifts that are happening because each one of the synchronous parts takes a clock cycle before the register or the signal gets updated. And sometimes that's difficult to hold in your head. Whereas here you can see exactly when things are happening and if they've happened in time for you to do your combinatorial logic uh on the right data and not maybe you know the next clock cycle along so that's the first point so you really need to when you're developing this particularly if you're new to any of this do the simulation part get some insight you can really see what the hgl you're writing is actually doing at a low level rather than you just guessing you know because it could be doing something that you think's right. It seems to give the right answer, but it may not actually be doing it right at a low level. This enables you to really dive in there and have a good look. So that's the first part. So that innate gave me the courage to then move on to the second bit. Um, so if I return you back to what our choices were when we ran this, we could either simulate or we could run. Um, I'm just going to change this now. So uh, I have another thing which I've called SPI LED Bench. So this is the next stage. So I actually want to now run the FPGA HDL inside the chip, and, uh, but I want to see you know see it working and doing something. So I'm going to get it to actually output to some LEDs. So just like we did in the simulation part here, what I've done is I've created a SPI led bench which is a higher level module if you like that then brings into being the um, FPGA module and exercises it just in the same way we're doing in the simulation but actually within the harbor itself and then we want to output uh, some of the results on the LEDs now in this case in the alloy board I've only got three LEDs so I've only got three bits effectively so let's just return to a couple of things in here. What we're going to do is we're going to actually show on those LEDs the lower three bits of the data we receive. Uh, and then we're going to exercise. So we're going to do the same sort of thing we're doing in the simulator here. We're going to count up. Okay. So what we should see is counting on the LEDs when things actually operate. So let's have a quick look at this. So my TP platform up here, just ignore that for the moment. Um, that enables me to output some signals that I can analyze. Um, so first of all, I'm grabbing these three LEDs and I'm concatenating them together into one unit called LED. Um, kind of like uh, 
Laurie's code earlier, only not with a range. I'm doing them discreetly by their name because they're individually named. I'm creating a counter signal just like I was in the simulator, a 10 bit signal. And the other signals that I had in the simulator, these were identical here. I'm creating a module and then I'm creating a soft, soft, a sub module called FPGA. Um, Ah, that's weird. I think I've got a mistake in here. Okay, let's just ignore that for a second. So uh, the next thing I'm doing here is I'm doing the same thing I did in the simulator below. I'm exercising the basically the uh, uh, SPI data signals, and I'm serializing some data, which I'm then sending into uh, Mozzie on the FPGA here. And then what's different? Oh, yes, the different thing I've added here. Obviously, I've got the test things down here. Ignore those for the moment because we're not using those. But on here, what I'm doing is I'm adding the LEDs. So I'm attaching the LEDs to the data register inside the FPGA. So the LEDs are literally showing the, the bottom three bits of the FPGA data. Right. Um, when, when this object is created, it creates an FPGA object because it needs that for the sub module, by the way. That's not obvious. So when I'm saying self FPGA here, I'm not saying self itself. I'm talking about an object called FPGA, which is one of our FPGA classes that it's created. Don't know what confusing myself now. So, what that enables me to do is then run that inside the FPGA. So, it's not very different from the simulation in this case. Uh, let me see if I can, I wonder if I can get, hmm. I'm going to switch over to the board here so you can see it. Um, damn it. Right. Before I do that, so I now have this here. So what I have to do is I have to copy that onto uh, the D drive. So when I run this here, what's now going to happen is it's going to run the test bench. It's going to effectively build the HGL in the test bench and it's going to run the program. So it's actually going to send it to the D drive, the output from that on here. And that will cause the circuit Python to notice that that file has changed and there's a new logic and it will reload it. With any luck. Uh, let me just get putty up here so I can see what's going. That's actually reloaded it. So if I go back to my circuit Python now.
Why have I lost that? To my list, it's annoying. Not the first time. Um, let me just take that off for a sec. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to run. So I'm going to program the chip up here. So that was as last week stuff. Okay. And then after I programmed it, I'm going to excite the clock pin, but only very slowly so that we can hopefully see what's going on on the LEDs. So if I now save that change, it should reload. Right. So if we switch now, we can see that the LEDs are counting. So basically the HDL for decoding uh, the SPI is running inside the chip here. Uh, and what it's receiving is a series of bytes that are incrementing, going 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, etc. Going around in a circle. And you can see that data that's being received, which is being mapped to these three LEDs or the least significant bits of that data. So we can see the output is actually doing uh, what we'd expect. So not only does our simulation work, but when we actually use it on the board inside the HDL, um, we've actually got everything working and operating inside in the logic. Which is quite interesting. And the other thing we can do is I've, if we go back to the HTL, um, Uh, can I show this at the same time? So what I'm going to do now is bring out the, see if I can bring in the um, logic. Bear with me. I'm going to try and capture the logic. I can't remember what I called it. What did I call it on here? This is annoying. Do, 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 do. Hold on, GTK, but the logic analyzer. Hold on. Oh. Bear with me just one second. Sorry, guys. It'd help if I was actually running the logic analyzer. Mm -hmm. Alright, show me it. Oh, I have to use a special setting for the logic analyzer. Bear with me. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, 
はい All right, let me just resize it, folks. Right, okay. So the other thing I, I've done is I've mapped the output. So we should be able to um, just recapture. Some logic here. Uh, okay, it's quite difficult to see because it's very slow. Uh, I wonder if I can. Okay, so we're looking at the lower three bits of the data here. So this is DLSB, and then the next, and then the next. So you can actually see it counting up here. Let's see if I can do a slightly longer. Um, Sample. There we go. So we can actually see what's being outputted to the test point. Remember, I mentioned before that I put some test points in. So what's what's happening here is I'm t I'm tapping those that internal data register signal and I'm outputting that on some other FPGA pins, um, which I can then look at with a log logic analyzer. Now you might not want to do this because you've got the LEDs, you say, but the, the trouble is, the, in order for the um, LEDs to work, you have to slow the clock down to a ridiculously low speed. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, this is a Sally one, a 16. Um, the, because in order to see on the LEDs, the, um, um, sorry, that was response to uh, Laurie's question about the logic analyzer. The LEDs are going to flash really fast at normal SPI transfer rates. So that's why I've slowed it down here. But when we get to real signals, we need to look at the uh, logic analyzer because they're going to be running a lot faster. So if we now, let me go back. I don't actually want to run that many signals. Eight seconds is an awfully long time for this. Okay. So if we now go back to the editor, uh, let's just bring that forward. Sorry. Sorry, guys. There's a lot of messing around with this. Um, on the uh, I'm just going to turn that slow clock off and then run at normal speed that we would using um, the internal clock. So here what I'm doing, um, so after we've programmed it, we have a delay, then we run the clock signal. So we output the clock from, remember this code's running on the ESPS2, so we output a clock constant clock running at 24 megahertz in this case here yeah. so that gets input to the FPGA because it needs a clock with an even duty cycle uh, we then pause let things settle down then we go into this kind of infinite loop and here all we do is we print writing out to the SPI we then pull down the CS pin 
we write a byte and then we take the SS bin back up and then we um, and then we can um, have a delay and then send the next byte. So in this case, I'm, I'm not. I'm still running the test bench inside the FPGA, so it's going to ignore this because it's got its own internally generated signals. But because we're now running at higher frequency, we we'll see a lot more going on inside the uh, logic. So let's go and do a let's save that. That's saved, and then I'll do another capture. So now we're capturing much higher speed data. So obviously when you look at it here, um, we'll see much more detail. So it's the same counting. It's just a significantly faster one. So the next stage is getting it to talk or getting it to listen to the FPGA, sorry, to the uh, ESP S2 sending that SPI data. Uh, and that's the bit that's not quite finished now. When I run this, so when I stop running the bench and actually have it um, interpret what's coming from the ESP, it gets it wrong. And I'm still trying to work out why that is. I've got a problem with the signals for some reason. Uh, when I look on the logic analyzer, as you're seeing here, I can see the signals being output. So if I keep those test points in, but I attach those test points to the incoming SPI signals, strangely, I see the chip select activating but not the clock and not the data so of course the internal hda doesn't capture anything and i'm really puzzled as to why this is happening because i'm pretty sure the pins are right because i'm using those to program the ice 40 in the first place and i know that that works so i've kind of been through and double checked but for somehow I'm getting some signals mixed up or there's some sort of problem that I'm missing um, to get the final piece of this working. Um, so that's currently where I am today. Um, I'm not going to go on much more than that really because what I need to do is actually solve the issue with the incoming signals and work out why that's not coming through properly uh, and at that point we then have a working SPI interface between the ESPS2 and the um, ICE40 FPGA. Then I can tidy all of this stuff up, start sewing it together, putting it into a kind of library format so that it's easy to call upon from CircuitPython and it's easy to use the FPGA uh, SPI bus part to integrate with any um, end margin stuff that you create yourselves. So you, you can literally either do it in a raw kind of form where you're just using the uh, ready signal and the data input. Um, but the other bit is to do the data return as well and add those signals in. So that you can send stuff to and from. So that's the simple level I want to get to, you know, hopefully next week. If I get a chance, I may do a bit over the weekend as well. Um, once I get my I.O. sorted and find out where my wayward SPI signals are disappearing to inside the FPGA. So that's where I am with that. Um, the other thing to consider beyond that SPI type exchange is to actually start memory mapping. Um, it is possible to memory map the SPI peripheral into the ESPS2 memory map, but you have to be a bit careful with the caching and stuff. 
Um, but that's the other way of doing it. That will give us addressable registers and memory directly from inside the um, ESPS2. Uh, and that's definitely a later option. I, I will most certainly use that when we move up to Quad SPI. Um, but that, that's a thing for later because there's all sorts of issues with the caching and things you have to be careful of. For the moment, we just stick with some raw SPI and get some examples working and then binding the get together the Python model of the HDL and the interface to talking to it from CircuitPython to try and unify that that composition and the way that we do that. Um, is it still one bit SPI rather than eight bit? This implementation that I'm working on right now is just a one bit, so it's duplex. So it's one bit up, one bit down, just like regular duplex SPI line. But eventually it will be quad SPI, so it'll be a nibble up and down. Uh, that, that's my plan. I was going to do Octo, but there's some issues getting the Octo working in the S2. There's certainly no support for it. Um, in the current uh, IDF and the um, th there's definitely no support for it in circuit Python so I'm thinking of using the extra pins so stick to quad SPI and then use the extra pins as extra interface outputs um, I'll come back to that maybe review part of that because uh, we have no time to do it this evening do it on the next next episode. Um, so that's where we are with that. Um, we're making some progress. There's some annoying gotchas. There's a lot of weird stuff with Mygen that I'm just starting to get my head round. Uh, it's different. I quite like it, but you've kind of got this um, quite Pythonic. Um, approach I guess for want of a better term uh, any questions people let me know quickly before I disappear um, again as usual please join me down on the forum with everyone else and uh, let me just give you that address uh, Um, those conversations will carry on, I'm sure, down on the forum and elsewhere. Um, but please feel free to join us. If you've got anything you want me to cover to do with Alloy next week, uh, which should be on Wednesday this week, coming, um, just drop a note, either to me directly as a DM in the forum, or there's a thread which talks about the stream updates where I normally mention what I'm going to talk about in the next stream, etc. Just just bang something off there uh, if there's something you want me to cover. And I'd be um, more than interested in hearing that and um, adding in some bits and pieces that people want covered. Um, that will do me for today. Have a good weekend, folks. Um, I'm going to possibly do a bit of work over the weekend on some of this stuff. Certainly, I'd love to get this uh, HDL working with the ESPS2. So if I get a chance, I will spend some time doing that. But in the meantime, have a good one, folks. Enjoy yourselves, relax. And I will speak to you either down in the forum or next week. So thank you. Ciao.